in the history of statistics, we got off to a rough start because the math that I've been describing for you using means and standard deviations from samples and estimating population parameters from those sample and means and standard deviations, that works well when you're using large sample sizes because the large samples tend to approximate a normal distribution. But what began to happen in the early days of statistics was researchers would do a project, they would calculate statistics, and yet their results wouldn't replicate. There was too much variability in the results that they were getting. With the large sample sizes, the standard deviations approximated normality. But with small sample sizes, the amount of error in the estimations increased dramatically, resulting in a biased estimator for the population standard deviation. And this bias gets even worse when the sample sizes are smaller. So the solution to this small sample size problem came to us through a master brewer and statistician named William Seeley Gossett, who worked for the Guinness Brewing Company. So let's use an example that might have been in place when Gossett was doing his research. The problem is how much sugar is in the mix that will be fermented and turned into the beer. Now, the sweetness is measured in degrees saccharin, and that sugar content is very important because if you have too much sugar, then the alcohol content will be too high, and that will mean you have to pay higher taxes on the finished product. But if the sugar content is too low, the alcohol content will be too low, and your customers will not be satisfied with that. So there is a, a small range in which that sugar content must fall for it to be ideal for consistent brewing of these batches of beer over time. And what Gossett was able to figure out was how much adjustment had to be made when you're using a small sample size. And he put these adjustments into tables. Here's what a T distribution looks like. And this is the, the distribution that Gossett helped us in creating. You can see that it is very similar to a normal distribution, the normal distribution being the solid black line. However, as sample sizes get smaller, from sample sizes of 20 to 10, we see that at the top of the curve, our T distribution gets a little shorter. And in the tails, the tails spread out a little further. Now you may look at this and think, well, that doesn't look too bad. Let's look at it up close. Here we see our 1.96 standard deviation cut off for a standard normal distribution, resulting in 0 0.025 in each tail of the distribution. Well, if we have a degrees of freedom of 20 and this tail has been extended, now the proportion is 0 0.0325. And it gets even worse with a T distribution with a degrees of freedom of 10. Now our 0 0.025 is enlarged to a 0 0.0392. Or if we look at it like this, the 1.96 standard deviation cutoff gives us the range where 5% of the scores are divided into the two tails. Let's superimpose a T distribution with degrees of freedom of 20. And notice that the bracket is laying out that 5%. But now what we will do is move this cutoff score out until it reaches the end of that tail. And you see what we've done is increase from 1.96 to 2.086 standard deviations. Well, if we have 10 degrees of freedom, how much further do we need to move the cutoff score? It's going to go all the way out to 2.228 standard deviations. That is the, the change that has to occur. So we still have only 5% split between each of the two tails. So in every case, the T distribution is going to have, is going to be a larger number than 1.96. And what I want to do is prove that to ourselves using the sampling week 13 Excel spreadsheet. This time we will use the T distribution tab. 
There's only one thing that you need to enter for this particular example, and that is the degrees of freedom. And what we want to know is how many degrees of freedom are necessary in order for us to reach normality, or a T distribution that approaches a normal curve. Well, let's start by entering 10 degrees of freedom, which we know is very small. We get a critical value, that, that cutoff score, those standard deviations at 2.228. Remember that the Z score we're looking for is 1.96. So obviously 10 is too small. We remember that 30 degrees of freedom, or a sample size of 30, was one that uh, was recommended for us. So let's enter 30 for our degrees of freedom. This would actually be a sample size of 31. And we see that we've moved our critical value much closer. It's a 2.042. Let's keep changing these numbers. Let's go with 100. Now our critical value is a 1.98, much closer. Let's make it 1,000. Now we have a score that is very close to normality. So what we can see is by enlarging the sample size, we are approximating a normal curve. And also we can see that with very small sample sizes, that the T distribution varies widely from the 1.96 value that we need as we're using this to create our interval estimates. We're going to do this ourselves with an example that was drawn from the homework. A survey of credit card data from 70 households had a sample mean of $9,312 of credit card debt with a sample standard deviation of $4,007. We need to compute a 95% confidence interval around this mean. So to do this, we're going to use the interval week 13 Excel spreadsheet, and we'll be using the, the ICU data tab. Scroll down a little bit and you'll see a box that says, do it yourself, sigma unknown, which is the T distribution. You can see that there are three places to enter data for the sample mean, the sample standard deviation, and the sample size. So let's enter the values from our question. The sample mean is 9,312. The sample standard deviation is 4007. And our sample size is 70. The coefficient is set by default at a 0.95, but you can change that to a 0.90 or a 0.99 or any other value that you choose. This gives us a margin of error, a point estimate, which is the same as the sample mean, and a range around that mean, which is our 95% confidence interval. If you'd like to enter these same data points into the box above where sigma is known, you'll see that we still get a result, but it is going to be slightly different than the values here. You can, of course, play with the sample size from this, the values where, where the sigma is known, and if you increase the sample size, then your, your uh, lower and upper limits will dial in to something much more similar to what you would get with that T value. What I've been describing for you, showing you these values, could be put into a table where we see the cutoff score for one degree of freedom, for two, for three, for four, or five. And that is what William Seeley Gossett did. He created tables that, that tell us how, what the cutoff score would be depending on how many degrees of freedom we have with our sample. Well, he wanted to publish this and uh, went to Guinness to ask for permission to publish, and they initially turned him down. There had been some kind of disagreement that had occurred previously uh, with publications, and so Guinness had just issued a blanket refusal to allow their, um, their brewers or their scientists to publish. However, Gossett pointed out that the benefit of these tables isn't something that would really help the competition. This was something that was really useful for other statisticians. And so Guinness made the exception for William Seeley Gossett to be able to publish with the stipulation that he had to publish under a pseudonym. And he chose the pseudonym student. And this is why we use students T tables or students T distribution. And the distribution is not named specifically after William Seeley Gossett. The publication of these tables occurred in the journal Biometrica in 1908. 
And it was originally called student's Z distribution, referring to the Z distribution that had existed with a normal curve. However, in 1912, Carl Pearson, the author of the journal, received a letter from a young Ronald Fisher describing a mistake in the publication of these tables. And what he described was that the sample size, the n value, should be reduced by one in what he called degrees of freedom. Everything that I've been describing to you about degrees of freedom and the n minus one, that is all the, the summation of the work that was done by William C. Lee Gossett, Carl Pearson, and Ronald Fisher, resulting in what we have today as students' T distribution tables. So here are some conclusions about the T distribution. Number one, the T distribution is a little more leptocurtic than the Z distribution, meaning that more than 5% of the scores are beyond 1.96. And so we need to make an adjustment based on degrees of freedom. With fewer degrees of freedom or smaller sample size, the T distribution is even more leptocurtic. But as we increase the degrees of freedom, the T distribution approaches a normal distribution. Use a T distribution whenever sigma has been estimated from the sample standard deviation. And the truth is, regardless of what studies you're doing, it is safe to use the student's T distribution, student's T testing for almost all applications. <laughs>